Armin. Hey. What's going, What's going on, on? Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. It is very, very hot here in Texas. <laughs> uh, yeah. It, it's over 100 in Ohio today. Oh, you guys are living the same life I am. It's, it's brutal, isn't it? It is. It just kills everything. It kills every, every sense of I'm going to get outside and do something today is squashed by, I think I'm going to lay on the couch <laughs> in the air conditioning. Yeah. <laughs> you can't even walk the dogs. It's too hot. Like the pavement is too hot for them. Yeah. We just got back walking the dogs. Uh, and it was so hot out there. Like we were, we were jogging across the street and just shade to shade. Just right. To grass. Jogging. And yeah. yeah, it's a struggle. Well, just to introduce, uh, we have, we have a crew here, as you can tell. <laughs> um, we have, we have Kat. She's in Delaware. Hi, Kat. And Hi. then, and then uh, we have Charlie, Amy, and myself. We're in Columbus, Ohio. Hello, Charlie. Hello, Amy. Hello, Scott. And I, I am the Clydesdale, so that's where the name comes from. I'm I love it. The big it. guy in the middle. I love it. <laughs> and we are the friends. <laughs> the friends. The friends. And we all capital do fitness. T, capital T, capital F, the friends. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. So we just wanted to, to take, some, uh, first of all, thank you very much for, for joining us on the podcast. Uh, we actually just wanted to take some time to get to know you a little bit better. Oh, my pleasure. Let's do this. So, um, so where, did, where did you grow up? I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. One of the few uh, people that are actually born, and raised. born yeah. and raised in Los Angeles, California. Yeah. And, and so what was that like growing up in LA? Um, LA is an interesting place. You know, I, I lived in, um, I live, I lived in Glendale, California, which is one of the largest suburbs of California. Um, there's a very large Armenian population there. I'm Armenian by ethnicity. Um, Actually, the largest population of Armenians in the world outside of the capital of Armenia is in Glendale, California. So uh, it was really, really cool um, growing up in L.A. You know, my my dad's an entrepreneur. Uh, my mom was a stay at home mom. Uh, I have two older brothers who are uh, quite a bit older than me. I mean, not like we're not talking like 20 years. My oldest brother is eight years older than me. And our the brother between us is six years older than me. So they were always going to school together, high school together, college around the same time. And I was always kind of like the little brat growing up uh, who was like back at home with mom and dad. And uh, so that was really interesting. I kind of had a a mixed childhood of being sort of the youngest, but also I was like so much younger that I was at home with my mom and, and, and dad, you know, way more than they were, especially through like my teenage years. They were already in college. And I was getting into high school and, and, uh, you know, junior high, high school. So it was really interesting to kind of be an, an only child a little bit for, for high school. But, uh, it was, it was a really cool experience. You know, Los Angeles is an interesting place. It has a lot of things that you kind of don't realize how unique and special they are to LA until you leave or go visit other places. Um, just an example of that would be, uh, man, I mean, it's hard to say how often I was able to experience like really, really wildly uncommon things. Like I went to a high school that was right next to Disney studios, NBC studios in, in Burbank, California. So, you know, in high school, I was part of a media program where we learned animation and we learned writing and we learned editing and we learned shooting and we did music videos and, you know, we visited uh, the Nickelodeon studios as a kid in, in junior high or middle school as like a field trip. So like people would, you know, my wife is from uh, Eastern Washington state and she was saying we went and milked cows on a field trip, field trip. In, the, in the fifth grade. Yeah. And I went to Nickelodeon studios and I met the people behind SpongeBob and Hey Arnold and got to take pictures with all the voice actors and all that stuff and tour the studios and stuff. It, was, it really was a, a very very different way of uh, of growing up and it was wonderful. Yeah, that's did cool. You, did you get to get slimed on that? I did not get slimed. I did not get slimed. <laughs> Although I hundred percent would have taken the offer. <laughs> it offered it for sure. Did did that exposure to all that media did that sort of shape who you are today? 
I think subconsciously, yes. Yeah, I think without really realizing it. Um, I, you know, oh, man, I guess in a way, it's kind of strange because I grew up, you know, my parents would take me to school and pick me up. And, you know, most of the time it was my mom, but my dad would pick me up too. And they're always listening to radio, uh, talk radio, AM, AM talk radio. And the way to, on the way to school, we would listen to morning shows, which was mostly talk radio. So in a strange way, I kind of grew up listening to, you know, some of the biggest and most professional, you know, broadcasters, radio broadcasters. So now that I look back at that, I can, I can see that thread, you know, of being exposed to that so often for so long from such a young age and how it's kind of affected my profession today, or at least how I do my work today, that uh, it, it did definitely have, you know, it did definitely have a little bit of, of carryover. You know, when, when I say I did a media program in high school, I mean, well, I remember our freshman year, our big project was producing a radio show. So we had, we had tape recorders, like little tape recorders. And we had these little mini tapes and we would record, you know, uh, an interview and then a segment and then a commercial. And then we would edit it all together and make a, like, you know, a six minute long little piece. So that's like a mini radio show. Um, and our senior year was a music video. We got to pick a song and we, you know, hired actors and we found, you know, our, our locations to shoot. And, uh, you know, we did this whole, whole thing. And so I, now am constantly editing video and audio and thinking about, you know, what are my motion graphics going to look like? How do I, what, 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 you know, content for the medium for the audience, like how does all that overlap together? Um, and looking back at it without really realizing it, I was kind of doing a lot of that stuff in high school, just, just having been in that environment. What's funny is I was doing research on you. You know, I, I watch your show all the time. Uh, so I, I feel like I know you, but then trying to put, I know all these pieces, but trying to find the timeline of how everything happened is very difficult. <laughs> what does research on me look like? I'm curious. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> you, so you've got a lot out there. A lot. <laughs> you have so many different podcasts and articles and things and stuff was overlapping. You know, I have tons of questions about how you, Chase, and Cliff, and Kyle got all together because I couldn't find anything on that. So, but yeah, I mean, where do you get that work ethic, Armin? I mean, you, you do hustle and create a ton of content. Um, and like, where do, you, where do you get that energy? And uh, Yeah, you know, I, I appreciate hearing that. That does mean a lot to me to, to, to hear sort of what I do described with, you know, work ethic hustle and like positive terms like that. It is good to hear that. And to answer your question, I think I feel like if I am not creating something, I'm wasting my time. And if there is a moment in which I can apply myself to creating something or through my process of you know, the end result being a new thing that I've created, um, if I'm not doing that, I feel like I am giving up a gift or, you know, not living up to my potential. And I don't mean that in the sense of I'm such a gifted creator and, and what I give to the world is something that everyone should appreciate. And, and you know, I, I don't mean it in that sense. I mean it in the sense that I'm incredibly lucky to get to do what I'm able to do. And if I were to stop or slow down or, you know, take that for granted, it would poison that well that I draw on to still continue to be able to do that. So you ended up in this like fitness strength space. Did you do anything like that growing up or did you just fall into this space? My entire life is a series of happy accidents. That's, that's like, that is all of it. Start to finish. Um, I, I, and I, I tell, I tell this to, to people all the time. 
I feel like I wasn't even really alive until I was like 18 or 19. Like, I feel like everything just kind of occurred. You know, the high school that I went to was the high school my, my brothers went to. The school that I went to growing up was either the school my brothers went to or the school that the high school that I was going to go to had suggested as a junior high. So it was like everything was kind of, I did, you know, I did Boy Scouts of America because my brothers did Boy Scouts of America and it would look good on college applications. So I kind of had this very, um, it's, it felt like on a track, right? My, my life felt like on a track. And so the reason why I say I don't really feel like I was really alive until 18 or 19 is because that's when I really started understanding that I had agency and control over my decision-making processes in a real sense where the consequences were actually being laid out because of the things that I was choosing to do. And that is both a really good thing and in my, you know, in some ways a really bad thing, right? Because I, uh, I, in a way was kind of sheltered and privileged growing up and, uh, I'm incredibly grateful to my parents for being able to give that to me. I mean, they came from nothing. Uh, they were both born in Iran. Uh, they basically got stuck in the United States because they were here when the, uh, the revolution happened in 79 and they made a whole lot of lemonade out of a whole lot of lemons. And I love them very much for that. And I'm incredibly grateful to them for that opportunity. And so when I say like everything's a series of accidents, you know, growing up, I ran because that's what my oldest brothers did. I played baseball because that's what my older brothers did. Like, you know, I, I participated in the types of sports that they would, and I was not good at any of them. Um, I actually didn't really do any sort of fitness or anything until I found CrossFit my, uh, in college when I was 19. And it was almost more of a, an intellectual thing than it was a physical thing. I wasn't really interested in being good at squats or running or anything like that because what I was interested in is something that would engage me um, and be stimulating because I was really bored in school and I was studying things that were interesting but not particularly challenging. And I definitely didn't want to follow through my my you know, the career path of my degree, I got a degree in psychology and philosophy. So either I was going to go and be, you know, some sort of a occupational therapist or something like that, or I was going to go back into academia and teach. And I was actually pretty deep along the line of doing the teaching route of getting my, you know, my master, like moving into getting my master's in philosophy and, you know, finding my programs and applying and all that stuff. Um, when I graduated college and I'd been crossing for a couple of years, my brother right around the, my graduation, uh, my oldest brother was just, you know, he was kind of tired of the work that he was doing at the moment and wanted to branch out, branch out on his own and do his own thing. You know, like I said, my dad's an entrepreneur, so it kind of runs in the family. So my oldest brother was also into this CrossFit thing. He's the one who introduced it to me. And he said, you know what? I think I'm going to open a gym. I said, you know what? I don't want to go back to school. So what if I, what if I like clean the floors and that I'll help you, I'll help you organize it and set it up. And that, that went from, you know, me being sort of the first like quote unquote employee to, you know, helping basically run and manage and own this gym with my brother for four or five years. And that's kind of how I ended up in this like strength and fitness space and learning about so much of this is this idea of like, I was in college. I was bored. I started doing CrossFit because I was bored and it, I just got bit by the bug. I immediately fell in love with the idea that my input in terms of effort and time and you know uh, motivation gives a direct and clear output in, a, in, in an incredibly positive way. Um, and I was, I was very, very interested in learning more about it and teaching as many people as I could about it. So just back a little bit, did you go, did you go away for college or did you stay in the, in the LA area? I actually went to three different colleges. I ended up, uh, I did, I did one university, um, in, uh, for my freshman year in central California where I, I moved out for that year. Um, I moved back in with my, uh, I moved back in with my older brother, my middle brother, um, in Century City, West LA. Uh, cause I went to Santa Monica college for uh, a year after that to get transfer units. And then I transferred to UC Irvine, which is about an hour outside of LA. Now it's right next to Disneyland. 
Um, and at that point I did a year living with my older brother until he got married and he was like, you can't live with me. My wife is moving in, bro. And I was like, all right, that makes, that makes total sense. I, I mean, that's kind of fucked, but that makes total sense, buddy. Uh, and then I moved back in with my parents. Um, uh, I think my senior year, I was, I was about to rent a, I was about to rent an apartment and my mom and dad were like, listen, we have the extra room and uh, we promise not to bother you. And I remember my oldest brother was like, what the hell is going on here? Like I had this crazy curfew and I had to be home at this time and I didn't even get a car and this and that. And like you're giving him like one of like, you know, our old cars and you're telling him you're not going to bother him or ask him where he's going and he's getting to come home whenever he wants. And I was definitely the spoiled youngest yeah, child. Baby. That's 100% fact. 100% fact. The perks of being the youngest for sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so you do the, you do the affiliate owner thing and being in California, did you make a lot of contacts, contacts with other affiliate owners, people at HQ during that time, or did that come later? Yeah. So, you know, I, I started CrossFitting in late 2008. Uh, I was at the CrossFit games in 2009 just to, to be there. I was, I was, it was in Northern California and it was an easy drive. And I went up there for the weekend with my brother and some friends of ours. Um, I have been, I mean, the fact that I was in Los Angeles during that time doing CrossFit, it's like brought me in contact with basically every single person who became a big mover or shaker in the CrossFit space. The only people I didn't really interact with were people who worked at CrossFit HQ. Uh, I just never really had I had either a neutral or deeply negative relationship with CrossFit HQ up until probably like 2018. It was just, we were just very not on the same terms. And um, part of that was, you know, my immaturity and my behavior. Part of it was I just didn't see eye to eye with, with the, the philosophy behind how they were running things and why they were doing certain things. Um, and, you know, I think, I think it just kind of took its took its time. I think the relationship that I, I developed over time with the people at CrossFit HQ, who uh, many of them aren't there anymore. Um, you know, it took, it took eight or 10 or 12 years, but I'd say they're probably on the positive side at this point. Yeah. It's, it's been a massive change in the last couple of years for you. And I, I think, um, yeah, we'll get into that later. Cause we're, or that's way down the timeline. Oh yeah. So at some point, you become, you become a blogger. Yeah. The naked CrossFitter, right? That's right. You did do your research. I love that. <laughs> yeah. So I, 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 uh, you know, when we opened our gym, we hired somebody who had owned a gym in South Dakota and had just moved back to California to LA with his wife. And, um, we hired him and we, we brought him and his wife on board and he had been, writing a blog, uh, like a weekly blog for years. And we wrote a daily, I mean, five days a week, Monday through Friday, we wrote a blog on our website, on the, our, on our gym's website to publish the workout. But also, you know, it's like you, you, you just fill out information. You tell people about nutrition, you tell people about choices, you tell people about motivation, whatever, right. Tell people about ourselves and each other. Um, but he kind of encouraged me. He said, listen, you should start writing. Just start writing. Like commit to writing once a week. And it doesn't matter if people read it or not, but you can just write it and put it out there and see what happens. So I sort of had this blog that I had used um, when I first started doing CrossFit as sort of a training log and sort of like this weird diary. I was going through some emotional stuff. You know what I mean? I was a teenager. It was weird times. Uh, so I had, I had this very strange blog that, that I had used and I was like, you know what, I'm just going to use the same site and I'm going to change all the branding. I'll just change the website. And I never got rid of the old journals that I used anyway. I don't think so anyway. Uh, but I changed the name to the naked CrossFitter and the idea behind the naked CrossFitter was, uh, you guys know the chef, Jamie Oliver, he had this show called the naked chef and it was, it was, I, I grew up watching, you know, cooking TV. It was like, this, this is hilarious. This is great. This guy is like funny and he simplifies everything and he offers this very like 
uh, you know, accessible version of what would be considered inaccessible in that it's, you know, supposed to be fancy or difficult cooking techniques, right? And I was like, oh, it's perfect. I, I absolutely, I get it. I absolutely get it right off the bat, the naked CrossFitter. So that's what I started doing. And then I started kind of writing little meme I'm before memes, but it was like meme parody, satire about how ridiculous we as CrossFitters are and all the crazy things that we do on a regular basis you know, basically anything you see a meme about on like make Watts great again yeah. or fluffy duck or like all of that. I was, I was talking about all of that, you know, way, way back, like, you know, 2010, 2011, you know, chalking before going for a run, no matter what happens, you take your shirt off, you know, uh, you don't care about your score until you really care about your score. Like all of this stuff, I was writing articles about all of it. And somehow that also translated into being very critical of CrossFit HQ at some point. And so, you know, this was um, in the, I'm going to say the golden age of CrossFit parody accounts, you know, drywall was a thing. Uh, Beast modal domains was a thing. Ben Smith's dad was a thing. And uh, these were, these were really interesting times. I was the only one who wasn't anonymous. And so I kind of had a little bit more of a target on my back, uh, which both was, you know, ended up being positive in some senses and negative in other senses. But yeah, the Naked CrossFitter ended up getting me into uh, contact with Eddie Ift. And then we started the Wadcast podcast together, which ended up getting me into uh, getting me recruited by Flow Sports to run Flow Elite, which ended up putting me here in Austin, Texas. It, it like it all really kind of stems from that decision to start this very strange out there parody blog that was fashioned after a cooking show, you know? <laughs> that is so, an accident, yeah. So the yeah. parody blog, The Naked CrossFitter, is, things you said there, is that what got you kicked out of the CrossFit Games? Yeah, it was part of what got me kicked out of the CrossFit Games. So in 2012, I was, I was physically removed from the CrossFit Games, <laughs> escorted by uh, uh, Justin Berg, the general no. manager of the CrossFit Games, and like, five security guards found me and, and told me you're not welcome here and removed me from the grounds uh, in Carson, California. And the lead up to that, so that was the 2012 CrossFit Games, the lead up to that was I had been very vocally critical about the 2012 Open. I still think to this day, the first workout of the 2012 Open was probably the biggest mistake that they'd ever made in terms of programming for that large of a group. It was seven minutes of burpees, which is, you know, it's an awful workout. It sucks. I didn't do very well at it. And, uh, you know, the, the, the test itself works well if you have a dozen people or a hundred people doing the workout. But when you have 25,000 people doing the workout, you end up getting these like really crazy bottlenecks where one rep on the burpee ends up being a thousand spots on the leaderboard. And then you're not really differentiating between fitness in a, in like a surgical sense, you're differentiating between fitness in like a very blunt, uh, blunt sense. And I, I did not agree with that. I felt like that was really poorly done. Now I've communicated that to you in a significantly more polite <laughs> and thoughtful way than I was communicating that back in 2012. In 2012, I was like, you know, am I allowed to drop some, some, yes. yeah. So yes. I was like, fuck these guys. These guys are idiots. You morons didn't think this through. How could you be running this company? You don't know anything about math. What's wrong with you? I was like, I, was, I went really hard in the paint. It was bad. It was really bad. Um, so that part, kind of got me on their radar as, uh, you know, maybe not the nicest person. Uh, it was all coming from a place of one, my ego was bruised because I didn't do as well as I expected to do in the open that year. And two, I loved CrossFit so much that just something that I see as such a simple mistake that could have been rectified if they just asked somebody outside of their own walls would have would have improved it from a place of like love. You know what I mean? I was just trying to come from a place of love. Um, yeah. You cared about it. You cared. Too I cared much. About it. So it was, mm -hmm. it was very internal. It was, it was, it. it wasn't. And that's the crazy part because if whenever I saw someone from outside of the community 
critiquing CrossFit, I was the first person to tell them how wrong they were about their assumptions of what CrossFit was and, you know, where they didn't understand it and try and explain the methodology and get them on board and get them to figure out like, Hey, there's actually a lot more to this than, you know, uh, you know, kipping pull-ups or whatever. And so in a strange way, like I was a huge, like a staunch defender of CrossFit and its methodologies. And at the same time, I was very, very critical of the decisions that were being made within CrossFit HQ that were like shaping what this thing has become. So that was part of the, the thing that soured my relationship with HQ. Um, they had shut down a charity event that was going under the name Fight on Bad. Fight on Bad is that, you know, it's a, it's a big workout. It's a well-known workout, but it's also one of the very few things that CrossFit actually owns in terms of an IP. So they actually have the trademark of that phrase, Fight on Bad. And so this charity event was using both the workout and the name. And they're also, you know, trying to grow their footprint and grow their brand, but CrossFit owned that brand. So CrossFit shut them down, which I didn't like because it was, you know, I was friends with the people who started it. It was a really big event that was going on every year in September uh, in, in our community. I'd been a part of it since almost the beginning. Um, so I was upset about that. The replacement for Fight Gone Bad was CrossFit for Hope. CrossFit for Hope, I felt like, was you know, not nearly as cool as Fight Gone Bad was. And you know, I kind of was really critical about their marketing around CrossFit for Hope. And then I think the thing that was the final sort of straw was in the SoCal regionals in 2012, I borrowed a media shirt and let myself backstage so that I could hang out with my friends who were competing that year. Uh, My, my, now wife, then girlfriend had just qualified for regionals on a team, which I am absolutely not salty about. (laughs) She qualified for regionals within a few months of starting doing CrossFit and I've never ever come close to qualifying regionals, not salty at all. Uh, She had just uh, qualified with a team. My, uh, my best friend training partner had qualified individually. Uh, You know, we had a bunch of people out of, are like sister gyms that were qualified as teams and individuals. And so it was this really big celebration for me to be able to go and hang out with them. And essentially what I wanted to be able to do was take a couple of pictures of them so they could have stuff for their Facebooks. And uh, at the same time, I wanted to be able to, you know, get them things if they needed it. Here's some water. Here's like snacks. You wanted to be the pit crew. I wanted to be a pit crew. I was like, I can't, I, I didn't make it. I'm not good enough to be here in terms of like my own athletic endeavors and merit. So I might as well be here to support my friends and be a pit crew. So it, in the process of doing that, having had the Naked CrossFitter blog and having had the Wadcast podcast for a little while at that point, people knew who I was. And I just put it out there. I said, hey, if anybody has a, is, if anybody's on the media team and has a spare t-shirt, I wear a large. And so <laughs> I got myself a CrossFit media team shirt and then, you know, happened to figure out what color the, uh, the wristbands were. And just, I, uh, I confidently carried myself back where I uh, technically was not supposed to be. And I got a letter that said, if you ever do that again, you're never going to be allowed at any CrossFit event ever again. And I was like, of course I'm never going to do that again. I already got what I wanted. Who cares? (laughs) (laughs) They didn't like that. And the end result of all of that was we were at the CrossFit Games in 2012 and uh, uh, Justin Berg pops into the, the suite that we were in and basically says, I'm looking for Arm and Hammer. Which one of you is Arm and Hammer? And I was like, you don't even know my full name. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know who I am. That's fantastic. Yeah. It's like, that's me. What's up? It's like, you're not allowed to be here kindly leave the premises with me and these five people (laughs) wow did did you know did he say why or did you already know why uh i mean listen it was not a surprise that they were (laughs) upset with me it was a surprise that they went so far as to as to remove (laughs) me from the crossfit games for sure and okay so let's fast i'm not going to fast forward through your process here but i want to to put a little (laughs) addendum to this this story Let's fast forward to the 2019 CrossFit Games, Madison, Wisconsin. It's the day before the games are supposed to kick off. I'm in Madison. 
And, you know, I've at this point, I have this YouTube channel, I'm making content for the community, and I still, I am still kind of bitter about this whole being kicked out in 2012 thing because the result of that ended up being I was blackballed from CrossFit events until 2018. And so it wasn't until the 2019 CrossFit Games that I was actually given a media pass to any CrossFit event, even though I asked every single year. They always told me, we don't supply media passes to outside media. And I was like, my friends are outside media and you just gave them a pass with like a smiley face emoji. What the hell are you talking about? So anyway, <laughs> the, the fast forward to the 2019 CrossFit Games, it's the day before the games and I'm like, okay, uh, I've got to do a little video that says I'm here. We're having a good time. Uh, here's what to expect. We don't know what's going on. This is like the first version of this CrossFit Games. Everything's going to be so crazy. So I'm walking around the venue, outside of the venue, and I'm in the parking lot and I see the Coliseum and the Coliseum is like Reebok branded. It looks great. And I'm like, all right, great. That can be like my background. So I walk a little bit closer and I see there's a break in the fence and it's right next to the Coliseum. It's where the sort of like uh, uh, logistical crews are coming in and out to help sort of organize what's going on inside the park. And I was like, all right, sick. I'm going to stand right in that break in the fence and I'm going to have the Coliseum behind me, it's going to look like I have cool access. Like I found this really cool spot to have a background and I'm going to shoot my little video here and tell people what to expect. And as I'm recording, I hear like someone lay on their horn and I was like, Oh no. And I look over and uh, there's two Porsches and like a, and like a Mercedes Benz van or something that are pulling up. And in 2019 Porsche provided cars for, the staff, the senior staff at CrossFit HQ and some of the, some of the competitors. And I knew immediately, I was like, that's Justin Burt. There's no, <laughs> other, like, there's no other person who would be, who that would be, that's Justin Burt. And up until this point, I had not had a single interaction with him since he removed me from the CrossFit Games in 2012. And we knew of each other, obviously, there's no <laughs> doubt about that, but we didn't know each other. We didn't. And so the last interaction we had had kind of, you know, left a bitter taste in my mouth. And so I was like, I can't believe this is happening again. And I'm not even doing anything wrong, but it looks like I'm definitely doing something wrong because we were told specifically, don't try and get into the venue before the event kicks off. You know, you're, you don't, don't film anything. You shouldn't be filming. I was like, I'm just standing here. I'm trying to get this background shot. I was like, this guy's going to, this guy's going to fucking kick me out of the games again. again. In my first shot, like my first shot in the modern games where I can actually do this. And he actually was really gracious. It was really cool about it. He was like, you're not doing anything you're not supposed to be doing, are you? And so we talked for a few minutes. And before he left, I was like, Justin, do you remember the 2012 CrossFit Games? Do you remember kicking me out of the 2012 CrossFit Games? And he goes, you know, I do remember that. But I, I definitely need to tell you, I had no idea who you were or why I was removing you. <laughs> Someone called me as I was running from one fire to another fire and said, this is now the most important thing you have to do. Get this guy out of here. He's like, I, I just did what I was told. So I'm glad that you're here now, but I, I hope there's no hard feelings. And I was like, all right, well, that does make me feel a little bit better about, about things. Well, and to be number one priority with all the other fires going on, <laughs> I mean, that's got to make you feel pretty good. I mean, yeah, you're a big deal. That. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what's called uh, living rent-free in somebody's brain. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> I was there. So, so how did you get hooked up with Flo? Like, uh, that's, that is 100% on their end. They had hired somebody. Um, they hired this guy named Jonathan Glancy. Glancy used to work for CrossFit HQ. He was a, a producer there. Uh, he actually lived with like Marquez and all those guys. He was, he was deep in the CrossFit HQ uh, world. In fact, one of my favorite videos was something that he produced. You remember that video? Uh, it must have been going into the 2014 games. It was, how do you beat Rich Froning? It was this very short video of people. You know, he was just asking a whole lot of these top competitors, how do you beat Rich? How do you beat Rich? And all of them were, you know, I, I don't know. You just have to hope he has a bad day or whatever. It was like this really cool little video. He produced that video. And um, anyway, so he had left CrossFit HQ and been hired by Flow Sports, which is a company here in Austin. Flow had like made its name sort of doing um, coverage of sports that usually don't get coverage. Very, very in-depth 
deep coverage of things like wrestling and track and field, things that usually only get any sort of airtime, you know, Olympic years, they would do it all year round or all year round, all season round in super in depth. And so they wanted to do something like that with CrossFit. They could kind of tell that the CrossFit space was blowing up and they felt like there was an opportunity with a few various events outside of the game season. And so they needed somebody to be the content side. They needed somebody to be the sort of senior, the, the, the title I had was senior editor, but basically I was, I was the editor of that website. So I was the, the content side. I was the engine of content for Flow Elite. And Glancy, I had met him briefly. Maybe we passed by each other for 30 seconds at the same gym in like 2013 once. Um, and he knew that I was done part of the Wadcast podcast, but at that time he worked for CrossFit HQ. I was persona non grata. And even just being like in an Instagram photo with me was enough to get some people like potentially losing their jobs. So it was just like, don't associate with this guy. And so our, our meeting was just, Hey, you're a guy with the camera. I'm a guy with the camera. I'm not going to get in your way. You're not going to get in my way. I had no idea who he was shooting for. He had no idea what I was doing. It didn't really matter. Fast forward to 2015 and he finds me. He's like, Hey man, um, you know, let me take you out for coffee. Let me tell you what this thing's about. And I was like, all right, well, there's no way I'm leaving California. So, you know, I, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to say no to your job offer, but if you want to buy me coffee, you can come to the gym. We'll work out. You can buy me coffee. And that's exactly what he did. He came to the gym. We did a workout. We went next door to the coffee shop. Uh, this great Cuban bakery called Porto's. It's amazing. If you ever go to, if you ever go to Los Angeles, I 100% suggest you go to Porto's. It's like the best Cuban bakery in the nation. It's fantastic. So anyway, neither here nor there. We got ourselves some coffee and uh, he kind of gave me the pitch and I told him, you know what? I'm pretty happy um, running the gym. I'm happy being a coach. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. Um, I'm not interested. And he kind of kept following up and following up. And over time, over the course of a few months, I sort of got a much better understanding of what it was they were offering me, what type of a role they were offering me, what I was going to be able to do within that role, how it was going to broaden my connections within the CrossFit space, get me in front of way, way more people in terms of uh, the uh, ability to build a much bigger platform than what I had with the Wadcast podcast. Um, it, and they, it was going to be all on their dime. So it was like corporate sponsored in order for me to do what I do best, which was like create content, talk to the people who care about this more than anybody else in the world. It's like I could do that in my sleep and I loved doing it. And they were going to pay me um, to, to do that and grow this platform. And I 100%, once I started realizing sort of what the opportunity was like, um, I was 100% in. The only hurdle was, you know, they, they needed me to relocate to Austin. And, you know, that was a challenge at the time. You know, my, my wife and I were dating. We were living in California. Um, we were both really big fans of living in Los Angeles, but we were also both kind of looking for what our next move was going to be. And so... Um, eventually ended up saying yes to the job. My wife decided that she would put up with me in Austin as much as she put up with me in Los Angeles. Thank goodness for that. And uh, we ended up out here and it was, it was interesting. I worked for flow for about three years and right from the get go, you know, I never agreed with, I was, I was very critical within flow of their, of the subscription model. I felt like they just didn't understand the CrossFit space um, so that's kind of been the big rub with them is, you know, they put the, they put the events that they broadcast behind the paywall. So my content was never really behind a paywall. It was always the content was coming, the content was coming, the content was coming, and then an event would happen, you know, Wadapalooza is going on. Okay. So now we have to, we have to pimp out Wadapalooza. I was like, okay, so let's pimp out Wadapalooza. And then it wouldn't go well or, you know, some sort of technical difficulty would happen and people would be like, Armin, what the fuck is going on? Like, how come? we're paying like 30 bucks to watch this thing and it's not going well. And I was like, let me talk to production. I have no fucking idea. I just, I just make stat. I got make articles. I don't know what you're about. So it was this really, uh, it was this really interesting um, role to be in where, you know, I, I learned a lot about production and their business model and why their business model works the way it does. 
and uh, how it could be successful. But I, I felt like they never really met uh, the CrossFit community halfway, you know, CrossFit for it, it, honestly, I would, I'm not even gonna say for better or worse for worse CrossFit HQ set the tone of their broadcasts in a way that was so far above what the market was able to support that they poisoned the well for what anybody else would ever be able to do in the space for a long time. Even to this day, they, the people aren't able to match what CrossFit was able to do because for CrossFit, it was a marketing expense. So spending $10 million on the, on the live streams and the broadcasts and making the super professional broadcast, it was a write-off. And yet for every other business that's trying to thrive or flourish in the space, it is hundreds of thousands of dollars and it's going to bankrupt them. And so, you know, CrossFit did no one any favors by setting the tone at something that was not just undeserved in the market, but completely un uh, maintainable within the space. And so, you know, I, I tried to communicate that with flow. It's like, guys, you have to meet them halfway because they're used to not paying for anything and getting literal, like the highest quality TV level production. And that's not what we're giving them and they're paying for it. So there was, there was definitely some, uh, like we, we, I had a couple of tough conversations within the, co the company because of, uh, because of some disagreements over that. But uh, Flow in general was a, a really, really great experience for me. I think, I, I think I've watched three or four years of Wadapalooza um, through Flow Elite, and I think I've gotten my money back every year <laughs> I, I wouldn't <laughs> for the surprised. month. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Customer service that, is, got, ooh, is pretty good. <laughs> That's, that's, what, that's a good way of handling it. You know, I think that's a reasonable way of handling it because sometimes they just weren't able to deliver on what they were promising. Um, and they've gotten better over the years. I think this last one was decent, but you know, it, it's just, it might be a little bit, uh, it's a little late and you know, they, they also have to just understand they can't treat the CrossFit space like all the other sports that they cover at the same time. So did you guys get married in Texas or did you guys get married in LA? Or somewhere else we got married our marriage ceremony was in Los Angeles so uh, we got married in LA in 2017 uh, we were living in Austin at the time and uh, we had decided to kind of do um, like not an elopement but something close we just wanted to do something small now um, something small ended up looking like, you know, let's go to, let's go, let's go to Europe. Let's bring our parents and let's make that a thing. Just, just the families. And to me, I have a very, very close relationship with my grandmother on my mom's side. She's my last remaining grandparent. Um, I grew up with her. The day that I was born is the day she made it to, to the United States from Iran. It had been 10 years since my mom had seen her mom. And my mom, wow. uh, my, my grandma shows up to the States on the day that I'm born. So we have this very special connection. I spent a lot of time with my grandmother growing up. And she is, no one knows how old she is because she was born in the old country like 90 years ago. So we just guess that she's like 90-ish years old. Um, and there's just no way that she was going to be able to make a flight or a trip like that. So we knew that we would have to go if if it was so important to me to have my grandmother there. We would have to be in Los Angeles to do it. And if we're going to be in Los Angeles to do it and all my family is there and my, all my cousins and my uncles and my friends and all the people I grew up with and all the friends that my wife and I made together while we were living there. Well, then that small little elopement that was just our parents and our families turned into what is, to be fair, a small Armenian wedding of something like 220 people <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was definitely, it was definitely, uh, escalated quickly. I think is a good way of describing that it escalated very quickly, but it was beautiful. It was the happiest day of my life. It was great. Aww. And she's, is she a doctor or in the medical field? Somehow, she's a right? nurse. Yeah, she's a nurse. She's a nurse. Okay. So she's been a nurse, uh, for about a year and a half now, maybe a little bit. Uh, yeah, just about a year and a half, a little bit over a year and a half. Uh, she worked for a year in, a uh, in an ER here in Central Texas, about an hour away from home, um, in Temple, uh, and right before all this COVID nineteen stuff happened, we yeah we had already decided that a year was more than enough. You know, the putting thirty thousand miles on her like brand new car in the first eleven months of working there was just 
way too much to deal with on a regular basis. So uh, she ended up leaving the ER and, and works at a, a clinic like three minutes away from our house. So she's right down the street from us. It's, it's, it's great. I'm sure the and dogs did, love that too. Yeah, the dogs love it. <laughs> they do indeed. And how did you guys meet? <laughs> okay. All right. So, uh, all right. So I started doing CrossFit, right? And I wasn't in any good shape, but, uh, you know, you gain a little bit of confidence. You gain a little bit of confidence when you start, you know, being able to do pull-ups and snatching more than 45 pounds and all that good stuff. And, uh, there, you know, I, I was CrossFitting in two really, really interesting places. One was CrossFit Los Angeles, which is in Santa Monica, California. And one was CrossFit Balboa, which was owned uh, at that point by John Wellborn of CrossFit football and power athlete fame. And so I was in this really strange place. I was trying to figure out like, I need to do, I need to work. Uh, I need a job. Let's, let's figure things out. And so I reached out to some of the people who I was working out with in either of those gyms. And uh, uh, I had just heard of this little company that sold women's yoga clothes called Lululemon. And I was like, that would be a really dope place to work. I would be surrounded by really pretty girls all day long and at every customer, and I get a discount for my own clothes, which they, they had just started their men's line. They just had like two pairs of shorts and, a, and one shirt. And I was like, these are great. I, I like working out in these. Like, this is a win-win situation. I'm going to meet pretty women and I'm going to have great looking workout clothes. Like, this is, this, there's no way this goes poorly. And so I started working at Lululemon and during the first training, they were like, you're not allowed to date any of your coworkers or the guests. And I was like, son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> this is not what I signed up for at all. <laughs> and I'm, listen, I'm a rule follower. I know it's hard to believe from what I described. <laughs> when I last I there, but I follow rules. And so when they told me it's against the rules to do that, I was like, oh, all right, I'll, I won't do that. So anyway, that was, in, that was in Santa Monica. So I started working at Lululemon in Santa Monica. They opened Lululemon in Glendale, California, which was a mile away from where our gym opened. So I transferred from that Santa Monica one to the one in Glendale. And after like maybe six months, I just, it wasn't sustainable for me to work both managing the gym and work at Lululemon at the same time. It wasn't, I had to pick. And obviously I picked the gym. So I'd put in my notice and it was like the last week that I was going to be there and uh, Katie comes in with one of her friends and I was like, what are they going to do? Fire me? So I gave them both my phone number <laughs> 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 under the guise of like, Hey, you know what? I own a gym right down the street. You guys should come try this CrossFit thing out. And uh, uh, they came to try the CrossFit thing out and uh, Katie and I hit it off. I mean, there's a whole lot of other stuff that happened in the middle there, but that's the quick version. That's how we met. And so she got really good at CrossFit quickly then. So yeah, she's, Katie's incredible. Um, I sold her her very first pair of Lululemon shorts. <laughs> uh, she's incredible. She grew up as a swimmer and a gymnast, which we all know is like, you know, throw in, I don't know, strongman as like the third sport as a child. And you basically have the ultimate fitness her. Yeah. So she grew up a swimmer and a gymnast. And uh, she was living in LA as a personal trainer. And she had, she was teaching these classes. I don't know if you guys remember like group fitness classes at 24 hour fitness, you know, and yeah. before this COVID thing, people would actually get together and exercise in the same room. It's hard. <laughs> to Crazy. And, yeah. And so she was teaching these like group fitness classes, which, you know, I, as a, as like a diehard CrossFitter was like, there's nothing that you could be doing that's harder than what I do, brother. <laughs> Let's get into it. And so our first few dates was going back and forth. She would take my class. I would take her class. And she would do these like body pump classes, which were brutal. I mean, just, just it would ravage my body. I mean, we're talking hundreds of lunges and squats and jump squats and push-ups and these little five-pound weights that would kick my ass. And so, and the way that those classes goes, like the instructor is doing the workouts while they're teaching it. So she's like moving around and like all peppy and listening to music and talking and encouraging people and teaching things. And so she had, she had like a pretty elite engine, like mm -hmm. just right off the bat. And uh, having grown up as a swimmer and a gymnast, picking up things like, you know, handstand push-ups and deadlifts was easy for her. Uh, she 
fell into a great gym, not my gym. She did not join my gym. She joined a gym that was like a sister gym to ours, um, which was closer to where she lived and some more of her friends were going there with a fantastic coach and a great competitive program. And uh, she immediately, it, it like, it just, it clicked really well with her. She's competitive. She likes to get better at things. Um, you know, she wants to push herself. And so she was really able to, uh, to develop relatively quickly and, you know, make it onto the regionals team. You know, we met October 21st, 2011. She was competing at regionals in May of 2012. And she had, she had not done, she had done one CrossFit workout before we met. Wow. Yeah. That's it, pretty cool. It's great. She's, she's, she's ridiculous to this day, by the way. So she doesn't really do, we don't really do a lot of CrossFit. Like we, we have a gym basically in the garage, so we work out a lot, but we don't do like, you know, three on one off. Here's our strength work and our Metcon. We don't do anything like that on a regular basis, but when CrossFit workouts show up, you know, she still is like pushing me like to this day. She's still, and I work out, you know, I work out a little bit more than she does these days in terms of you know, the volume that I put in since I work from home and the garage is right there. Uh, and she still, she still kind of kicks my ass at some workouts. It's, it's crazy. She's, she's so competitive and <laughs> she's so fit. So I want to go back a little bit to uh, the 2010s. So you were kind of the only named antagonist of CrossFit until 2018. Yeah, something really, like they, that. <laughs> they had their only media. They had their own media that hail CrossFit. We're great. Everything's super good. Um, and you're really the only one kind of poking holes in that. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, I think people tried. I don't know. I think some people tried and were able to sort of do things here and there in terms of existing as outside media. My role uh, up until... Um, you know, 2015 ish is when I was hired at flow. So my role up until that point was on the wadcast. I was sort of the, um, the critical guy, the, the younger voice on that podcast, the, you know, the diehard dude, like, who's like way too into this competitive CrossFit thing. And, you know, I was still really critical of what CrossFit was going on, but it was such a, strange time because at that time there was still the threat of you know getting de-affiliated you know not by your choice by greg glassman or someone at crossfit hq basically seeing what you're saying about it and saying well then obviously if you don't agree with us then you're no longer a gym and as a gym owner with my older brother like that's our livelihood as well as our coaches and our community that we're talking about and there's just too much to risk for me to continue being that antagonistic and so I toned down things a little bit. And then when I got my job at Flow, it was much more of a professional capacity of, all right, well, now I'm officially in the media. This is a real media company and I am their CrossFit space. Like I talked about CrossFit and weightlifting and strongman. Like that's one of the things about Flow that was super incredible. I mean, my, my time at Flow basically started right around the time when USA Weightlifting put itself on the map again in a worldwide stage. So 2015, Houston, Texas was where the world championships were. It was the first time it was in the States in like 40 years. And I was able to go to that. You know, I was able to do documentaries and content and stuff on like these weightlifters who were making it to the Olympics in 2016 and about their journeys. And so in a, in a way, you know, my, my coverage of the sport of strength sports in general was this sort of professionalization of what I had been doing up until that point. But CrossFit wasn't open to having anybody other than themselves telling that story. They refused to have any outside voices. It wasn't, I mean, and, you know, Justin LaFranco started the morning chalk up in 2016. Like uh, I want to say it was late 2016 is when he started the morning chalk up. And so he started the, the morning chalk up at a time when there weren't any outside media being sort of not even, not even welcomed, like allowed is probably a, a better way of describing that. So in a way it was, it was such a strange time to be in the media, in the CrossFit space, because there were so many hurdles to being able to do our jobs in, in a meaningful way. 
so yeah, it was, it was strange. And I, I still to this day think CrossFit made a lot of really, really deep, fundamental, philosophical errors in how they set themselves up uh, in, in, in their, their media structure um, and the, the choices they made in terms of blacklisting people and not allowing outside voices. I think it really hamstrung what CrossFit's message was, was uh, you know, where it was most effective. It really hamstrung them. So this is a big point in your timeline that I, I am really confused. So 2018 <laughs> comes. I know you leave Flow. The, the media floodgates open up for CrossFit. They, they get rid of all of their media. So now anybody in the world can kind of cover the sport. And you did, you started SAN with flow, right? And then, and then kind of kept it going after, which yes. is interesting as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how did all that go down for you in that, in that moment? Did you leave flow first? Uh, yeah. So I, I was part of a major downsizing that happened at Flow in uh, right around my birthday. So it was like April or May of 2018. Uh, they had made some really bad bets. Um, you know, various decisions that they had made in terms of their business structure and where they were expanding their business was just not, it just wasn't a good move. And I remember just being in the office and you could feel it in the air. Like it just wasn't, they weren't making the right moves. The core of the business was still super strong and really powerful, but they were expanding way too fast into, you know, uh, they're basically like prospecting for gold. You know, if they hit it, it was awesome. But if they don't hit it, they're just out completely. It's like that, that type of risk is, uh, you know, there's only so many times you're going to hit it. And so I was part of this downsizing that happened at Flow. I mean, I think they let go over the course of, you know, four months or five months in two really big moments, they let go something like 30% of their employees. And I was in the second phase of that, um, as well as Chase, my buddy, uh, who, who you've probably seen on my podcast a bunch of times on the channel, uh, my boy Chase, uh, we had, I had hired him. So I felt uh, especially bad. I felt really personally responsible. We brought him from West Virginia to Austin, Texas. Um, he was part of my team. He was my only direct team member that I was working with. Um, it was just, uh, it was, it was a really, really tough moment. And we, he had qualified for regionals that year. So that was the last year of regionals. He qualified for regionals with his team. Um, I was already scheduled to go and, and, you know, we had, tried to figure out what our move was going to be. I went to regionals and when I was there, it was in Salt Lake City. And I'm really grateful that I went because I got a chance to interact with the community that I was my, doing my best to serve. And I got a chance to be face-to-face -face with people, meeting, you know, seeing my, my friends who I, I don't get to see outside of events like that, the competitors, the coaches, the uh, business owners, the people running the, the um, different booths, like all these people that I see and I love and are my friends and I only really ever get to interact with them when we're traveling and we all end up at the same events together. It was such a breath of fresh air to see them and hear positive, positivity from them. Hey, you're going to be fine. You do great things. You know, whatever your next move is, we're going to support you. And so that was a moment where I decided, you know, this is an opportunity for me to roll the dice. I can either find a company to work with. And I interviewed with a couple different companies or I can just bet on myself. And I decided to bet on myself and uh, it was you know, a great decision. I, I do not regret that decision. It has not been, a, there's not been a single easy day since. Um, and it, there's no, you know, there hasn't been, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. Uh, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel, but we're still digging, we're still going. And it's, uh, it's been, it's been a hell of a ride. Yeah. It's been really crazy making that decision and, and, you know, rolling the dice on myself there. So, so you rolled that, you rolled those dice before you knew what happened at HQ with the release of the media. Correct. Because, because you, you kind of skyrocketed a little bit during that time because, you were willing to give your opinion as to what was going to happen. Yeah. You know, I think it's, 
it's a really weird thing uh, looking back at those those months, you know, from June till let's say June, July, and the first half of August. Uh, those few months in 2018, CrossFit was as much of a juggernaut as they had ever been up on that up until that point. I had an incredibly caustic relationship with Dave Castro, who was the guy who had control of the list and I was at the top. And so there was no chance. There was quite literally a 0% chance I would ever be involved in any official capacity in CrossFit or its businesses or its uh, events. And I knew that I would have to do something to sort of keep myself, um, you know, speaking to the community in the right way. And if you look back at my first like six weeks of content, it's all over the place. I mean, it's, it's like, you name it. I tried it. I did food reviews of like paleo pancakes versus not paleo pancakes. I did training, even though I am not at all like the guy to look at when it comes to like exercise, like, you know, sneaky fit is both, it's like a way of life and a descriptor. Like it is not, I'm not the guy to be like, here's my programming, bro. Like it doesn't work that way. Right. Um, I did, I did, uh, you know, travel little like documentaries with, um, uh, Sean Sweeney. I got a chance to hang out with him before the games and do like a little bit of content with him and his crew. I did everything I talked about and I, I, I got lucky because uh, I got to say Bruce, my favorite yeah. is when you were hiding from Castro who was yeah, firing at bushes. you yeah, yeah, in the yeah. bushes. <laughs> yeah. See, so like <laughs> it's like skits, like weird skits and stuff like none of it was what I'm doing right now. It was all like sort of these seeds. I was, I was trying so many different things and, and attempting so many different things and seeing sort of what would stick. And eventually, uh, you know, if you guys remember, Russell Berger got fired in June of 2018 uh, for these comments that he made on his Twitter. And that was like a perfect opportunity for me to commentate on that because I had had negative interactions with Russell Berger, as had so many other people. So I had a lot to say. I was like, man, that guy had it coming for a long time. And this just happened to be the straw that broke the camel's back, which, by the way, familiar narrative, right? Right. <laughs> you know, History repeats itself. A, yeah, that's not an accident. Uh, June is a very fucked up month for <laughs> <laughs> They need to shut down next year. Yeah, they need to take June off. Just take June off, CrossFit. Um, so basically, you know, I, I started kind of doing this commentary thing about, you know, oh, it turns out that my 10 at that point years of experience with CrossFit and CrossFit HQ and in the space and knowing all of these players can actually help color some of these news pieces that are happening and help explain why some of these things are either way more important than they might seem at first or actually not at all any sort of change or improvement based off of what has happened in the past. And so that's where this idea of, you know, there's a lot going on in our space, easy to miss some of the most important stories. That, that, there's, that's where that came from is this idea that, you know what, I can actually help this conversation. And it was through this whole experience of, you know, I knew Justin LaFranco very well. Uh, we had traveled together a lot. We had been to a lot of different events together. We worked really well together. Uh, I, had, I had close contacts with people at CrossFit and CrossFit HQ. And as these sort of rumors started coming out that, you know, Greg Glassman is unhappy with how CrossFit games is going right now. And, oh, maybe regionals are going to go away. And, oh, maybe some people are going to lose their jobs. As these rumors started spreading and as this story started growing and suddenly you started realizing like, oh, this is real. This is actually going to happen. You know, Justin was the first person to break the story that, you know, CrossFit fired 100 people and that regionals were going to go away. And I was the first person to follow that up with any sort of commentary, contextualization, or, um, you know, sort of explanation that made sense within the context of the history of CrossFit. And I think people at first were like, who the hell is this guy? Because the people who didn't know me from Naked CrossFitter or the Wadcast or Flow Elite, people were like, who is this guy? Like, what is he talking about? How does he, why is he talking as if he knows what, what is actually going on? 
And there were a lot, I, I still remember there were people who were like, this is fake. Regionals are still around. You're such a liar. You're just making this up for video views. And I was like, I don't know what to tell you, but you're in for a hell of a surprise, buddy. Like, I, I, you're so fucked right now that it's going to be, I wish I could see you when you actually heard the news. And so for a long time, there was this, there was this idea of, oh, this is all rumor. This is all hearsay. None of this is true. CrossFit hasn't officially said anything. And I was like, guys, I literally had a phone call with Greg Glassman who told me what I'm communicating to you right now. Like, what other proof do you need? The guy's the one making the decisions. And so it was a, a, a process where I think the community was trying to figure out what was going on. And for me, it was helping galvanize what I actually do in the space. And, and since then, it's been very clear to me. You know, my role is I'm not here to tell people what to think or how to feel I'm not going to give you like clickbaity, you know, titles and, you know, uh, thumbnails and stuff that don't deliver on some sort of promise. I'm aware of one very simple fact. All of us love this thing and we talk about it constantly. And I'm also aware of the fact that I can provide a lot of context that almost nobody else in the entire world can. So whether that's just the fact that I've been around for as long as I have, and I know the people I do. Um, or the conversations that I have off the record that help color the sort of, uh, you know, context of these types of decisions and the environment that they're being made in, whatever that ends up being, I'm able to bring something to the table that helps people understand this entire thing much deeper. And the conversations that everybody is happening, that, that everyone's having, that are happening like before, during, and after every single class that's taking place in every single gym around the entire world is all around what's going on in the CrossFit space. And yet no one really knows what's going on in space. Everyone's kind of, it's a lot of conjecture. And so I knew that like through that, I learned that my role is, is to positively move that conversation forward. Like I can just grease the wheel a little bit. So the next time someone goes and they're rolling out on the floor next to their like training partner, they're like, Hey man, did you know, like, this is why this is happening. And I don't really care if they even mention me. It doesn't matter. It's like, you listen to sports talk radio. You sound smarter when you talk sports with your friends. You don't say, Oh, I heard on Jim Rome or, you know, you don't, it doesn't matter whether you credit the person. I don't care about that. You just do better in the conversation. And over time, everyone does better in the conversation. And then everybody's doing better in general. So I have to say, though, in addition to, you know, you just putting out the, the news and the information out there, you also put a lot of fun content out there. And one of the things that we've talked about on our show here is that gave us a lot of joy during being quarantined was your uh, training montage about <laughs> Rocky. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. <laughs> and Batman versus Superman. Yes. So That was amazing. I, okay, so my wife and I just – rewatch so okay we hbo max came out recently and they have like this hyper extended like super version of batman versus superman and i hadn't watched that movie since it came out it's just as bad as it was <laughs> <laughs> it's so, it's one of the worst movies i've ever seen yeah. and we sat there and we were we were ragging on it for the we watched it over the course of i think like two nights or three nights we watched it like episodically and uh, we were ragging on it the entire time. And then that training montage came up and Katie was like, didn't you do a video about this training montage? And I was like, that's the one. I did that one. I did that one. Yeah. Carmen, when I was in college, we used to watch uh, Mystery Science Theater 3000 or 2000, okay. whatever that was. And that, that's, it reminded me of that. Like you sitting there, I wanted to see like a little silhouette of your head, just like ragging on everything that was happening there. Yeah. I, I, I think I appreciate that's the best comparison that I could ever get. That's the best compliment <laughs> I could ever get for that type of thing. Thank you for that. You're welcome. It's awesome. Yeah. I shared I wanna... your Rocky montage uh, episode with tons of people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. I mean, the thing is I grew up watching all these movies too. Like these are, these are the training montages that I would think about when, you know, it's Saturday and I have like regionals on my mind and I'm taking it way too seriously. I was like, Rocky trained in the mountains, Rocky <laughs> trained in the mountains. And I'm like, you know, I have like a picture of like Dave Castro on like my mirror and I crumble it every morning, you know, the way he does with like the Drago picture. Like, uh -huh. you know, it's just, it's like this, the, the, the stupidity of, I mean, let's not say stupidity. The, 
the inherent meaninglessness of being really good at thrusters and burpees can be soul crushing. So you have to have a good time with the fact that like, hey, you know what? We're just exercising. And it turns out that in movies, they do a really good job of just mm -hmm. exercising. It's awesome. When you said that Ivan Drago just strict pressed 480 <laughs> pounds with people that close to him. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome, isn't it? It's yes. so, like they so, really next so keep level making stuff. stuff like that. <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, things have been kind of busy in the past. Yeah, like, I get it, I you know, get it. when things slow back down, I'd love to. The, the toughest part about that, and I think this was one of the challenges with that, is that I can't monetize any of those. Every single one of those is like forced demonetization. So it was all like a labor of love. I was like, man, there's nothing, there's no events going on. What am I going to talk about? Well, I'm constantly thinking about these things in my head anyway. So I might as well just share this with people. So yeah, for sure, I will do those again. I will absolutely do those again because so they're, they're so much fun. Yeah. I know, Kat, you had something. Uh, I just, I mean, first of all, I've, I've told you this before in Instagram, like I am in love with your brain. I think you're so smart. And I just can, I, I love how you contextualize everything that was happening when regionals went away and explaining sort of the professionalization of the sport. It just made, it made me feel calmer listening to you because it all made sense. Um, and it's clear that you've got such a background in the sport that, you know, other people don't have sort of that experience. But how do you go from getting kicked out of the games to basically being the mouthpiece for these important decisions and announcements like straight from Greg Glassman's mouth? Like, yeah, that's really weird, that right? Happen? Yeah, it's, it, is a, it, is a, it is a very weird uh, transition. And uh, I, appreciate, I appreciate hearing that. Um, you know, I, I tried to come at all these changes from a place of uh, – curiosity, sincerity, and positivity. You know, I didn't want to just rag on things because they were changing. And I think that came across over time throughout the types of content that I was making. Um, in terms of how I ended up in the role that I was, I don't know the answer to that. I, I, I honestly can't tell you. Um, I know that a big part of it was, you know, if I was to pinpoint moments, it was like, okay, when the news first started breaking that regionals were going away and sanctionals were coming in and people were being fired and the media was being opened up, you know, I probably sent out like two or three dozen text messages to some of the biggest people in the space. And at that point, I didn't know Greg Glassman personally. I'd never, I'd like met him a couple times in like the early 2010s at like regionals in passing. And so we weren't, we weren't like on a first name basis. I don't even know if he knew who I was at that point, but I just reached out to as many people as I could that were involved in as many different facets of the sport as I could. So from the vendors and the companies and the businesses that are built around it to the competitors, to the coaches, to people who worked at HQ. And I just tried to get some information. And I think being that persistent, especially with the, you know, knowledge, every single one of them knew that I was like on the list, like on the blacklist, every single one of them knew that I was persona non grata. And yet I was still actively looking for and trying to tell these stories. Um, I think that helped people understood that I was coming at it from a place of, you know, love and a place of um, just commitment to the thing. Right. And I don't think anybody is, especially me can give you an answer as to how, everything turned out the way it did because when I remember, you know, when I first started meeting with, you know, when I first started going face to face with Greg Glassman um, at the time, he was not the CEO and I was meeting with, with him and then CEO and, and just their like management and they would pull me aside and they'd be like, why are you still here? I'm like, I don't, I don't understand what the question is. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't get it. They're like, with the, they're like, we have never been welcoming to you here. We've never wanted you here. We've never tried to make it easy for you to be here. In fact, we've done the opposite. We've done everything we could to make it impossible for you to do your job, to you know, make it incredibly difficult for you to have access to any coaches or athletes. We've made it like, you know, we've set landmines and traps that you'd fallen into by 
doing what you had said you were going to do. And yet every time, like every event, every year, every week, you're still showing up and you're still talking about this thing. And you're still trying to get in on the action. Like what is happening? Like why haven't you quit yet? And I don't have a good answer for that. I honestly don't. I think, I think part of my persistence is the answer itself. Like just the fact that I'm incredibly stubborn and you know, I would be doing, I would be talking about this stuff anyway. You know, I just happen to have, uh, the luck that I have a really big platform to talk about it now. Um, and I have people who are, uh, willing to listen and understand and kind of get a better idea of like who I am through it. But there is no good answer or explanation as to why or how I got to the role that I got into outside of I just refused to give up regardless of even the people who I now talk to on a regular basis actively trying to get me to quit. Mm -hmm. And well, I mean, and Greg reaching out, that had to have been just of his own volition, right? I'm sure it wasn't people saying, hey, you should call this Garmin guy. I mean, I think my opinion, he's super smart, right? Like to his detriment probably, but super, super intelligent. And I think he probably saw that in you and, and respected you for that. Um, you know, I've seen a few interviews with him and like, you're the only one that can sort of control him, <laughs> you know, in a conversation. Yeah. Um, the only one that I could like watch from start to finish was the one that you did with him because, yeah. you know, I think you, there's a meeting of the minds there a little bit. And I don't mean, I mean that in the, in the most complimentary way. Yeah. You know, Greg, Greg Glassman and I, um, I think there's some philosophical similarities, uh, in terms of how and why we think about certain things, the process, the thought process. And this is also something that sometimes frustrates me a little bit is, you know, obviously not everybody thinks about things the same way. They don't value the same things. They don't prioritize the same things. We don't have the same ways of thinking through whatever decisions, actions, historical events, doesn't matter. Um, and sometimes that's frustrating for me because I, I am, I'm not the type of person that's a hundred percent confident that how I think is the way things should be. I'm the opposite. I'm going to hold in my head a hundred different answers and most of them are going to be exclusively impossible to coexist with the other ones. And that's a really challenging mindset to try and hold all the time. But what it helps me with is when someone does something, I, I think I can feel how they got to that decision point and, and sort of understand what they're trying to do or say, even if they don't, because I can, I can get it. I like, I, I, I can walk through their steps, maybe even cl more clearly than they can walk through their steps. Um, and so when I have opportunities to talk to Greg Glassman, you know, the, the interviews that I did with him, the context that I approach those interviews with is if he's bored, he's going to walk all over me. If, I just agree with everything he has to say. He's going to be bored and everyone coddles the guy. Yeah. No one says no. You know, if people do say no, they end up being part of the in, they end up being part of like his crew. They end up being around him all the time and people that, you know, challenge him. I think this happens with anybody who's in a position of power. They either embrace people that challenge them because they want to have someone who's not just a yes man around them, or they push people who challenge them completely away because they want to be surrounded by yes men. So if you were to break it down very simply, I think, you know, Greg Glassman in his interaction with the average CrossFit person and the average CrossFit media person was basically treated like, you know, Jesus come back to earth. Mm -hmm. And that's not good. That's not good for anybody's thought process. That's not good for how anybody thinks or functions. And I think part of that is one of the reasons why he got away with so many things for so long. And part of that is one of the reasons why it bit him in the ass so hard it, as it did this, this past June. But I made it a point to very actively present him, not just something that disagreed with what he was saying, but was a good reason why I disagreed with what he was saying. And I think that was something that he respected. Um, 
And I think it's something he still respects. I mean, I haven't spoken to him in the past few weeks, uh, not since a lot of this stuff happened, uh, not since the sale, I think. But I think he he respected the fact that I was willing to present to him a good reason why some of the things that he was saying or doing weren't the right move. Yeah. Well, I mean, you do a really good job of conveying that too. So thank you for that because we need more people like you in the space. I think it's, that was one of my biggest problems in over the past. I mean, you know, I felt for a very long time that nobody was willing to say no at CrossFit HQ that the people who were in charge and had power there and were running the show and making decisions were at least at the surface level saying that they wanted dissent, they wanted criticism, they wanted discussion, but realistically in practice, they didn't want any of that. What they wanted and what they got were people who just agreed with the decisions that they made. And maybe there was a little bit of hemming and hawing here and there, but I can't point to any situation where a decision that very clearly was going to go wrong, wasn't turned around. They always just did it, made it, fucked it up, and then resolved it without ever addressing the fact that they had fucked it up to begin with. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's an accident that we've never seen seven minutes of burpees show up in the open again, because it's a (laughs) fucking stupid workout for the open. It just doesn't make any sense. Stupid anyways. It's stupid anyways. Let's be fair here. (laughs) Let's be totally fair. Seven minutes of burpees burn in hell, sir. That is not it. But but the in terms of a test for for the open, it's a terrible test. It's a terrible test for the open because it doesn't give you nuanced, detailed information for the people who are going to be moving on to the next phase of competition. And I think it's not a mistake that they, they have. It's not accidental that they haven't done that. They realized how fucking stupid it was. They just never admitted it. They just never yeah. said it. And it's like, hey, man, I could have told you that was fucking dumb if you had told me in January that you were going to start the Open with seven minutes of burpees. I'd be like, hey, man, you have 25,000 people trying this out. I don't think you're going to be getting the information you want to get. Like the data is going to be skewed because of that. But, you know, that's, that's just the MO. For, for years, the MO was like, grow fast, move aggressively, do things that people think are impossible to do. But if you're going against the grain, you're not going to be here for very long. Yeah. It's kind of like, well, we'll probably never see ring push-ups, ring handstand push-ups in the games anymore. I, I mean, <laughs> listen, they did, it, what, they, they did it twice. They did it in 2010 and it was like kind of a disaster then. They did it again. And this, by the way, speaks, I think, to some of the ego that goes behind decision-making like that is – they run it again, but this time, instead of putting it on like Sunday morning when nobody was at the games, like I was at that event in 2010, Sunday morning, it was power cleans and ring hands and pushups. And it was me and 30 people in the stands. And I had a Cinnabon and I was crushing life. It was fantastic. <laughs> and fast forward to 2016 and it's the it's the live on ESPN in the stadium, yeah. in the stadium in front of thousands of people. They're, they're doing ring handstand pushups that start with a muscle up. So you have to muscle right. up your way to ring handstand pushup and not one consistent standard was held between all eight heats of males and females, not one consistent standard. So it's like, Oh, we're going to, we're going to broadcast us looking like morons to the <laughs> entire world. Like people are going to be sitting in a bar right now drinking their beers, talking about how stupid we all look because that was the decision made for this workout. And here we are. And it's still, it's like, we've never done another softball toss because that's fucking dumb. We've never done ring muscle or ring handstand pushups since then because they're fucking dumb. And it's like, yeah, these are bad ideas. You just need somebody to be like, Hey, by the way, you know, I'm, I'm just the coffee guy, but I overheard you saying this and that's a dumb idea. That's all you need. Someone in the room to do that. And that hasn't been the case for a long time. Well, I'm I'm enjoying this. We are we are way over we are, our time we're, frame. We're Scott's gonna Joe kill Rogan. me. We're I know. I love it though. Joe Rogan status here. We, we I can talk forever, guys. I love forever. it. We want to give you a chance to talk about sneaky fit a little bit. Oh, cool. Okay. Right? I, I have my shirt. Can you see my shirt? Yeah, I'm wearing, I'm rocking my shirt too. I appreciate that. Nice right, TikTok. Scott I'm might want to get something else in before then. I have to say, when you brought out sneaky fit, that spoke to me more than any other brand uh, that's come out from CrossFit or any other, any other media company. So the Sneaky Fit Summer Series, we're going to, this will be uh, uh, posted prior, like a week prior to that. 
Awesome. I want to give you an, a chance to, to promote a little bit. Okay, sweet. So yeah, th- thank you for saying that. So such kind words about Sneaky Fit. It is, a, it is like a descriptor that I've used for myself for a while. Ever since I stopped being like really good, like I'm mean, not really good, but like really into like competitive CrossFit for myself, uh, Sneaky Fit has been the jam because it's, it's just, I think it's something that a lot of people immediately understand what I mean when I say that and they, they live that life the same way I do. Um, the Sneaky Fit Summer Series it's something that I've been working on for a while, very, very hard, uh, uh, lots of work into it. It's basically an answer to what I see as a huge problem in the CrossFit space in terms of participatory events. It's like, if you're going to be competing, the only ways that you're going to be competing are either these in-person weekend long soul crushing events, or you're going to do you know something like the open. It's going to take four or five, six weeks. It's going to be a workout or two each week and you're going to repeat it over and over again. And, you know, I grew up running because it was what my older brothers did. And one of the things that we would always do were these like five K's or 10 K's or Turkey, Turkey trots or fun runs. And I've even done, you know, I've done like a Thanksgiving 5k since then, like in the past few years, I've done Thanksgiving. It's just something to participate in. And that didn't really exist in the space. You know, uh, I wanted to be able to provide some version of that, you know, it's like the commit, the time commitment is an hour, maybe an hour and a half. It's very not serious. I like, I don't know how to, to communicate that with people. The yeah, name, watch the, the promo. Yeah. Watch the <laughs> promo. The, the infomercial will give you an idea of how not serious we're, we should all be taking this. The names of the divisions are, I am taking this way too seriously, which is like the RX division or the, this is basically a meme, so whatever, which is like everybody else. Like if no one participates in the RX division, I will have done my job. That's basically what I'm trying to do. Like no one do the actual performance division. Everyone participate in the fun version. Um, and the idea is it's all on a clock. It's all digital. You grab a partner. They don't even have to be in the same room or the same country as you because they're just going to get a time to start working out and, uh, and like detailed instructions, like minute by minute instructions of what they do during that hour or 70 minutes or so. And uh, as long as you have a clock and as long as you have like, you know, some equipment, you can participate in this thing. And the, uh, the rub is that we're, if you're interested, going to all be hanging out on like a video conferencing call during the thing. Then we're going to broadcast that call. I'm going to talk to people while it's going on. I might talk a little bit of shit. It's about some people's, you know, uh, you know, if they're, if they're up for it, if they're in like the, I'm taking this way too seriously, I'm going to make fun of their, their bad reps. But generally it's just going to be everyone who's doing it, just hanging out in the same room together digitally, at least virtually, just having a good time and participating in this thing that isn't going to take all day or all week or all month. I love it. Awesome. And it's, it's happening August 1st? It is happening August 1st. Yeah, I, thought, I should, probably should bring that up. Uh, it's the Sneaky Fit Summer Series. It's August 1st. Registration is open right now. What, what, what's the date that this is being published? Uh, it'll I'll be tell you, one I'll week tell you guys the workouts in advance if you guys want to know them. It's going to be on the 27th. Okay, so by then, I think almost all the workouts. Are, so I'll tell you guys what the first workout is. How's that sound? Yeah, so yeah. The five of the five of us are gonna are gonna know what the first workout is before seven minutes of burpees <laughs> <laughs> and ring handstand pushups. So the yeah the the first the first workout is uh you know you and your partner you pick partner A partner B that's gonna follow along through the rest of the event. So partner A has slightly different workouts and partner B has slightly different workouts. You pick partner A partner B. It's two minute rounds. 24 feet anchored sit-ups, 12 dumbbell squats, and then in the remaining of time of that two minutes, max shoulder to the overhead with the dumbbells. So you go two minutes on, two minutes off, just going back and forth with your partner for 20 minutes, and your score is the total number of shoulder to overhead that you and your partner are able to do. It is a savage, brutal way to start. Sounds like it. it it's, 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 so again, I don't want anybody to do the I am taking this way too seriously. It is hard. <laughs> It is not an easy, like if you actually get after it and go for it, you're going to pay a dear price when it comes to the rest of those workouts. But in terms of a good sort of, you know, you're, it's a, you go, I go interval workout. You're only working two minutes at a time. You know, it's, it's tough. It's, it adds up, 
you know, the, the little rash that I got from the sit-ups just barely <laughs> healed after like a week. Uh, but it is, it is a very fun workout. And that, that's one of two partner workouts in the, uh, in the entire thing. That's the only one that works like the you go, I go. And uh, that's, the one of, that's one of two partner scored workouts. Are there going to be toes awesome. to bar? And should I do them one at a time? <laughs> there will not be toes to bar. So I, okay. I basically programmed this event over the, um, <clears throat> over the types of equipment that I and my friends would have access to, as well as potentially gyms who would like open their doors, but not necessarily have all the rig space. So you actually don't have any rig based workouts. There's no pull ups, there's perfect. no toes to bar. Yeah. You, be, you basically, if you're going to do it as win. written, yeah, it's perfect. Do it. <laughs> if, you, if you're going to do the workouts as written, uh, in the I am taking this way too seriously division, which by the way, your partners don't have to be the same. You can be like male, male partners or female, female or female, male. It doesn't matter. Just, you just have the equipment. Uh, you're going to need a pair of dumbbells. One person is going to need a rower and also a jump rope. That same person is going to need a jump rope and you're going to need a barbell. That's about it. Uh, those are the only pieces of equipment that you need. And um, other than that, if you're doing it in like the fun run division, I honestly don't even care what equipment you have or don't have. Like the workouts don't need to look even close to the actual workouts I've written other than you're on the same clock as everybody else because, you know, the the reason why <laughs> the reason why the, the scaling doesn't matter, you can go up or down or replace movements, I don't really, I don't really care, is because in the fun run division, the prize money that I'm giving out is for the five funniest team names. And Perfect. the performance doesn't matter. So you could be the best, cro like, you know, you could be the best crossfitter in the world. But if your team name is not funny to me, you're not winning any money. I apologize. Oh, this is going to be fun. I'm excited. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a great time. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. And as the workouts get released, I think more and more people are going to start, you know, court, sort of seeing what it is I'm talking about and getting a better idea of, oh, you don't really need to be in the same place at the same time. You don't need a ton of equipment. Mm -hmm. You just need you know, a clock and the desire to have, have fun with a bunch of people on the internet. I'm, I'm not going to make any promises, but there are four of us. I'm just saying, and we're not Do all it. together, but perhaps. Do it. Get, get, get two teams Amy? in there. Amy? <laughs> I think Amy? that could happen. Maybe some, some colorful costumes. Can we, can we add that to our Google sheet for our nutrition challenge? <laughs> oh, maybe. <laughs> I, I need some points for macros. We're doing a nutrition challenge, the four of us. So I love this it. Will work. That's fantastic. We'll think about it for sure. Well, Armin, we want to thank you so much for being with us. I still have a half a sheet of questions. Me too. <laughs> come, back. To. come back. Come <laughs> back. I'd love to come back. You guys, you this, is, this has been a lot of fun. Uh, awesome. As you can tell, I never shut up. So I just love having a, having a good time and having a good conversation. Um, you know, you just let me know when you want me back and I'll be here. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you well, so much. Have a great day and thank you so much for being with us and uh, we'll keep watching. I know you're close to 30,000 subscribers. Yeah, I'm like just under 30,000 subscribers on YouTube. So if just you're not like subscribing to Armin, make sure you go to Armin Hammer TV on YouTube, hit that subscribe button because uh, yeah. he's real close to 30 grand. Awesome. Yes. Thank you very much, folks. Really appreciate right. your time. Thank, thank you. Right. Bye. Talk to Bye. you soon.